working in progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> As we return to our study in the book of Judges, chapter five, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance? Shall we ask that he join with us in this meeting and that our minds might be open so that we might look to understand that which he presents before us? Shall we pray? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this new opportunity to open your word in the book of Judges. We thank you, Father, for this blessing of time to be able to study, of the ability to come together so that we may be joined together to understand that which you would present to us. We ask, Father, for your, your blessings and your guidance so that as we open your word, we might understand more of what is important for us to know at this time in this earth's history, and that we might see more that we need to understand so that our characters may become more like yours. Help us to this end, Father. Wherever two or three are gathered, there you may be also, is the promise that we claim. May your angels also attend us. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Now, as we, were, as we were looking at this, we were dividing the book of Judges, which is the Song of Deborah, into different stanzas. And we look again at Judges 5, verse 14. Out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek, After thee, Benjamin, among thy people out of Machir, or Manasseh, came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. So here we have the three sons of Raquel that are mentioned, or the three that came from Raquel, the two sons of Joseph and his brother Benjamin, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. Now, had we determined what that pen of the writer should actually be? Well, yeah. Um, so this has to do with the enumeration of the tribes. Okay. <clears throat> Is it also having to do with chronology? Yeah, that's that's the idea. So that the 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 numbering of the tribes relates to spans of time okay <clears throat> which, now, which we've determined pretty pretty objectively i think now we come back and the princes of issachar were with deborah even issachar also barak he was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. And the following verse. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleeding of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. What's being said here about Reuben? Well, there's divisions of Reuben, and there's uh, great impressions of heart and great searchings of heart. So there's two different uh, times it talks about in the divisions of Reuben. Okay. <clears throat> if we were to take a look at numbers. 32 versus 32. Well, let's let's look at numbers 32, verse 32, and see what Moses had had to say about the tribe of Reuben. Okay. 
So at this point, <clears throat> if we start in Numbers 32, 29, and Moses said unto them, if the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass with you over Jordan, every man armed to battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before you, then ye shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. But if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. <clears throat> and the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, as the Lord hath said unto thy servants, so we will do. We will pass over armed before the Lord in the land of Canaan, and the possession of our inheritance on this side of the Jordan may be ours. And Moses gave unto them, even to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, and unto the tribe, half-tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the king of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and the king of Og, the king of Bashan, the land and the cities thereof in the coasts, even the cities of the country round about. Okay. In this situation, when Issachar and Zebulun are being called, mm -hmm. does Reuben go to participate? Um, well, according to the passage here in Judges, that would be no. At least that's the guess that I have. It's kind of obscure, but because um, what it's trying to say, um, is that there was some kind of great searchings of heart on these. Well, I'm not sure what that means particularly. It doesn't really say. I assume that they didn't. But I think one of the things it's trying to point back to is the fact that that Reuben didn't join in this because uh, it says Gilead abode beyond Jordan and why did Dan remain in ships? So it's talking about those that didn't join referring to these different tribes. That's the way I understand it anyway. Well, if again we were if we were to take a look at this, here they're saying that Reuben was remi was remaining a Buddhist among the sheepfolds. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it seems that it doesn't go, and they doesn't leave uh, Gilead. Dan doesn't leave Gilead. So both of them are are not joining in this battle. That's the way I read it. So if we were to take a look at this, let's, let's say we combine this with a couple of New Testament verses. If we looked at Philippians 2, verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Okay. So Reuben was known for having large flocks and a lot of cattle. Mm -hmm. They needed a lot of grazing land. Here's a situation <clears throat> where Moses is telling them, you need to stand up with your brothers. You need to stand with your brothers. If you won't stand with your brothers, then you're not going to succeed as a tribe within this country. What they sought was they looked to continue taking care of their sheep. They wanted to hear the bleedings of the flock. Uh -huh. So while their brothers were fighting, they're standing around saying, is this something we really need to participate in? 
Mm-hmm. So are those of the tribe of Reuben fulfilling the warning that Moses gave them? Oh, yes, though, you know, I don't know how much these other tribes knew about what was happening. I mean, I mean, this is a poem and there's some illustrations here. Um, But, um, you know, it doesn't seem in Judges chapter four that they made any particular call to the other tribes to come help them. Okay. In preparing for further studies in the book of Judges, Mm -hmm. I have been looking at Judges 11 and 12. Okay. Now, if we were to take a look at the story briefly, cursorily, in Judges 12, we would see the following. We would have Jephthah's conflict with Ephraim. Mm -hmm. In Judges 12, 1, and the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. So here's Jephthah Mm -hmm. fighting the Ammonites and those of Ephraim are upset because they're saying they were not called. Yeah. And here he said, and Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. Mm -hmm. So what I wonder in this case is if a call did not go out throughout Israel and only two of the tribes chose to respond. It's possible. As another witness, when Saul was confronted where the the one city was being besieged and where the enemy wished to put the eyes out of the men of, of that city. How did Saul make his call to the rest of Israel? Didn't he cut up an ox and send a part of that ox to all of Israel and say for Saul and for Samuel? Well, I guess you probably are correct, but I don't, I don't really know that story. Um, Where is it? Hang on. So it should be in First Samuel, I would think. First Samuel eleven. Okay. Because then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Yeah, so it's in 11.7 that they take the yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and send them out. Throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, 
so it shall be done unto his oxen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in this case, Saul tears apart his equipment, his ability to till the land and says, if you will not follow after the word, my word and that of Samuel, this will be done unto you. Uh -huh. Your family will no longer be able to eat because you won't have oxen to use. So in Judges 12 and here in 1 Samuel 11, we have these examples of calls having been made. In one case, a call is made, no one responds. So I'm, I'm just wondering and having to ask if it was possible that a call was made here and the other tribes chose to think about what they've got, but not to come to the defense of their brothers. <clears throat> I mean, the, the kind of look that I'm getting is in Reuben that you've got these, these shepherds that have put their sheep where they can graze and they're sitting among the hills talking about what they're, what they're being asked to do. Hmm. I mean, it's possible. It just it's hard to know specifically what what's going on here because they don't give us enough detail but <clears throat> so taking this as a symbol mm -hmm. as a movement we are calling for unity mm -hmm. yet there are others that are within the movement that are not looking to accept the call to unity and they're wanting to sit where they are most comfortable to consider what's being said. Mm -hmm. They're acting just like Reuben. They are ignoring the battle that their brothers and sisters are going through. Yeah. They're so not... that's that, yeah. So that's definitely clear here when you look at this. Sorry to uh, sure. cut you off there, but um, so we got. You know, Issachar and Zebulun, those ones are um, with Deborah and Barak, right? Right. And we have, of course, the divisions of Reuben that are amongst the sheepfolds in Gilead beyond the Jordan. Um, Dan remains in ships. Ships are a symbol of the economy, right? Right. Ash has continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches, so that's where he's protected from... The waves. Um, now, the thing is, we have the princes of Issachar that were with Deborah. So we got, we know that Zebulun and Naphtali joined them. But here in this poem, we find that the princes of Issachar were with Deborah as well. So that's not all of Issachar, but the princes of Issachar. So the leaders. Yeah. So we don't know why that is. And Issachar is, hasn't joined them, but just the princes of Issachar have. Um, right, and we, we noted that of the different tribes that were, were mentioned, they're all of the northern tribes that are referred to, none of the southern tribes. All right. Um, so, and we know that Ephraim, it says there was a root of them against Amalek after thee. Benjamin among thy people out of Manker came governors and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. Um, so I'm not, and again, we looked at that before. Um, we're not sure exactly what that means regarding Ephraim and Benjamin and and. And also you have leaders out of uh, Manasseh or Macher, which is on the, the west side of the Jordan. So, and then it mentions Zebulun in that connection, so verse 14. So it's a little bit obscure to know what's happening. 
except that all these tribes are named and that there is a few from some of the tribes that does join in this battle, but most of the tribes don't. Right. Right. Even though, as we would see in Numbers 32, that Moses gave a great admonition that you're all in this together, you need to come to one another's defense. Right. Symbolically with what we have right now, we have many within this movement that are comfortable where they are at. They're comfortable with their understanding of the word. They're not that willing to delve deeply into it. They're not that willing to look for symbolic representations. They want it spelled out for them. They want it spelled out literally. They don't want to have to tax their minds to consider something else. Yeah. Well, the big problem that I have is that they seem to ignore the divisions that exist within the movement. <clears throat> right. Uh, and, and I've had emails from people saying, okay, what, are, what do you see are the divisions? Sort of in a mocking kind of way, because uh, they, you know, suppose division that exists, you know, from one brother. Um, other people have said, well, I just want people to follow me. That's why I think there are divisions. You know, it has to be my way. And, and so they're, they're not interested because they don't want to have anything to do with me being a leader or something in their minds, which of course is not what it's about at all. Um, so there's just this sort of skepticism. They kind of feel what they're doing is sufficient and that they can ignore everything else that other people are doing. And of course, that doesn't really make any sense to me. The biggest comments that I've been that I have been observing have been those that are complaining about the use of numbers. Right. So that that's the thing. They don't like what we're doing with numbers because it's too complicated for one. But also, um, it's, it's not something that they have control over. Not, not that they're saying that specifically, but, you know, since they don't really know what's going on, um, to me, it seems like it's an element of control. I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to go in that direction there with Samuel. Okay. But... <clears throat> Because I don't know, that's not, it's kind of off track there, but. Yeah, I, I don't have a direct answer there either. Yeah. So, so but this, as you're saying, it's this, the, the divisions that exist. Um, now, it talks here about the divisions of Reuben. Now, this, of course, would refer to uh, not divisions within the tribe, per se. Um, uh, the idea here would be. Um, well, I took it as a mathematical term, but it, it, um, it, it's also the word, it's related to the word Peleg or, or Peleg, you know, where the earth was divided in the time. So, so we don't know what specifically this means. I mean, we could think of it as sort of military di divisions, but I don't know if that's what it's talking about either. And why it mentions division of Rubens twice, divisions of Rubens twice. But in this, in the verse of 518, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized or jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Mm -hmm. So these two are being praised. And there's mm -hmm. questions that are being asked about all the other tribes. Right. So we know that the leaders of Issachar joined in. We have Zebulun and Naphtali that put their lives on the line. And poetically, I'm seeing that, that Deborah is basically saying, where were you when the attack came? Where were you on 9-11? Where were you 
on July 18th? Where were you on December 6th? Mm -hmm. Now, I took the divisions of Reuben, uh, that is, I took the numbering of the tribes from uh, numbers one and two and numbers uh, 26. Okay. And I looked at the difference between these. That is, Reuben has, uh, the difference is a 2,770 between the numberings, the two numberings. And um, when I looked at, so one of the places I looked at, and whether this is the correct place or not, is in 2020, we had, of course, made a prediction regarding July 18th. And we have some symbols there. One of the symbols is the first day of the fifth month, which is July 22nd, 2020. So it doesn't end up being July 21st, but it's July 22nd. And that happens to be a 2,777 or 2,770 days from um, that date on the mind calendar, uh, uh, December 21st, 2012. Now, if I did an inclusive count, it would be July 21st, but I just have uh, just a cardinal count. And, and so maybe that's something to do with the divisions of Reuben in the sense that um, once we have that failure of that prediction, uh, we have people who start to fall away from the understanding of our prediction. And, and, and we saw that happen, you know, some quite, quite suddenly with July 18th failure, they just disappeared. Um, and then, of course, progressively. So I don't know, but that's just a mathematical calculation of uh, what might be applied. All right. Are there any other thoughts of potential symbols that we're looking in this section in Judges 5. Regarding Reuben, it has to do, do with vision, right? The son of vision or something to do like that. So I thought maybe because it's mentioned like it's being, being doubled, maybe that means there's two different ways of viewing, studying God's word and interpreting the, the, the prophecies in, in the movement right now. I mean, two major factions. Two major factions possible, but I mean, the doubling about the divisions of Reuben, especially where Reuben was one that did not live up to his birthright as eldest son would be a um, he'd be a difficult example to use in relative to the movement. Right now we have a problem because Reuben. Since he did not receive any of the birthright, he did not become the priest of the family. It was not through him that Christ descended. And he did not receive the double portion. He was very much cut out from the blessing that, that had historically been given to the eldest son. That and his dalliance with Bilha, Raquel's handmaid, basically sealed his fate. So if there are two divisions, are there divisions, two major divisions within those that have been associated with the movement?
I mean, we know of the division, of course, with Harmindi. Yeah. We have a division also with those that you, at the very early part of the movement's days chose to go a different direction, such as the path of the just and all of their associated ministries. Um, There's Mark Bruce that had the wow. tree of life, right? I'm right. trying okay. to remember all the names. Yeah, so we did have Ruben connected with, um, with Parminder. So remember we had done that line where we counted from, um, where was it here? I'm just gonna find it. Yeah, so we did it from the last day of the general conference, November 4th, 1888. Right. For 46,500 days to Parmender's ordination. And then from August 29th, 2019 to December 6th, 2020 is 465 days. So that would be a division of Reuben. Would so I, I would agree, but so that, that goes back to the question. Is it possible then that this with the divisions of Reuben are representative of those that had been part of the movement, but chose not to walk according to advancing light? Mm -hmm. And that would connect then um, that calculation, the difference between Reuben, um, deep marking, uh, midnight in 2020, three days after July 18th. So again, that would be um, that period of time. So that would be the divisions of Reuben, Carminder's group and FFA's group that really were of the same mind. Okay. Is that, does that, I mean, that we already have the mathematical calculation for it. So that fits in with what you're saying. So there's great danger within the movement when we are considering the situations like with why did Dan remain in ships, Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches because these again are being representative of those that are choosing not to walk according to advancing light. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so that that makes sense then that you have um, these different groups just represent the different people who are not supporting the message. Right. Now, what does this mean regarding? I mean, because we still are making this call, so this is just an illustration of something that happened. Um. So would we then take this because, okay, so in Judges chapter four, we've made the case that this has to do with Parminder's movement. Right. And that there is these judges that are raised up uh, to counteract Parminder's movement, which would represent a message within our movement particularly connected with chronology and with right. July 18th, 2020. Okay, so in this Song of Deborah then and Barak, um, we have the fact that there are groups that did not support this. Uh, Parminder's group, FFA, the people at FFA who ended up opposing uh, chronology and the use of numbers on December 6, 2020 that group itself had always been resistant to this, particularly Bronwyn was resistant uh, to everything that was happening, even though she shortly before uh, seemed to support it, but quickly um, regretted it after July 18th and, and sought everything she did to, to destroy the whole July 18th thing, which of course would destroy FFA in the end. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, so, but we still have these other groups and some of those, 
still to some degree are in the movement, but we, but we have different motivations. Right, some don't want to face trials, that would be Asher. Dan is, is more interested in financial situations. Um, uh, we have Ephraim, um, Benjamin, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that's on this side of the Jordan. Um, they, have, they have not followed um, completely, though out of Macher came governors. And there was a little bit of these groups that that supported the message. So there are some people with some partial support or some groups with support. I don't know what these groups would refer to specifically. I mean, we have, for Reuben, we have something quite specific, but we don't for these other ones. But here again, going back to another premise that we have addressed several times. Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to point a finger directly mm -hmm. because I know that when I point one, I've got three pointed back at myself. So each of these with the other tribes are also giving reference to different battles that we ourselves face on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah, and, and we know that, of course, none of this is putting us as the good guys and everybody else as the bad guys. Right. Right. So, I mean, we all have our battles that with self that, that are going on. Um, but we do know that the, the counsel that was given by Ellen White, which we have tried to follow, that is, we need to study together. Right. Um, not everybody's following that counsel. I mean, mostly what I see is that the studying that's going on is pretty basic Adventism. That seems to be what, what's going on around us, yes. Yeah. The, situation, the situation that we each have to face right now is this is not a time for us to remain with the milk of the word. We need to be willing and able to accept the meat of the word. Mm. Now, of course, we're not happy with the division that exists within the movement. The question is, what can be done about it? Right. And the only thing that I can see is to deal with our own house, to deal with our own selves. Are we connected with Christ? Okay. Agreed. <clears throat> so high praise is given to Zebulun and Naphtali. Mm -hmm. I don't see praise given to the others. No. Now the next stanza. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. What do we see here? What exactly is being said? Um, well, you're not having a um, people coming and fighting because of any personal gain. Okay. Um, so the kings came and fought. So that would refer to the kings of which kings are these? Kings of Canaan is being stated. So then fought the kings of Canaan. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. Um, so this is all just referring to the kings of Canaan? I'm looking. Um, yeah, because I mean, it is the the word kings is Melech, so that's kings. And when when we look at Joshua twelve twenty one, we know that there was a king of Tanakh and there was a king of Megiddo. 
could this be a reference back to them? Maybe that that could that would make sense. Make sense, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, because there's no kings in Israel, right? So, so this is kind of a doubling. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan. And we know from Joshua, or excuse me, from Judges 127, that neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibliam and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Hmm. Now, the Hebrew construction here is a mirror. Okay. Um, so when it, it, and it's kind of interesting because it says the kings, and then it's going to have fought, lechem. Uh, so, and that word means actually to feed, because uh, you can see the relationship to the word bread. Okay. Right. Um, but it's in the form that it's in, it shows that it's actually referring to, to battle. So they're going to consume. So the kings consumed, and then it has uh, at that place, right? So this word uh, as, as, however you want to say it. Um, at that time or place, also a conjunction, or therefore, right? So, so the kings came and fought, and then it's going to have, they fought, and then it says, uh, a king. So it's kind of interesting, it's not in the plural. Um, but then, um, a king of Canaan, so instead of the kings of Canaan. But, but the point is, it's done in this mirror. You got kings fought this word in the center, which is like uh, marking a time or a place, and then you have fought, and then you have king. Okay. So, so it, it's showing a chiasm. And then it says Canaan, Tanakh, and um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting the structure there. But it's also interesting that, that all of this is occurring in an area where the children of Israel did not drive out the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Canaanites have superiority in this area. They had not been driven out as you were told to do. So now they're going to be a thorn in your side they are fighting with you and they take no personal gain they're not taking spoil they're not taking the land they're getting no gain no gain of money They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. What do we see here? What can we see here? What can we symbolically apply here? Well, chronology. Okay. Because they're fighting against Sisera. The stars in their courses, which is, of course, reference to chronology, but also fought from heaven. But this is God's the one really in charge here. But is Sisera being compared with our adversary? Um, yeah, with Satan, a satanic yeah. power. Yeah, this is part of the great controversy. Okay. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. O oh, my soul, 
thou hast trodden down strength. What do we see here in 521? Okay, well, you're going too fast. So, okay. um, so just going back to uh, the previous verse. Right, 521. Um, so one of the things about the stars, this is a word that means a blazing star, uh, figuratively a prince. Uh, that's Kobat. Kokab. And then when it talks about in their courses, uh, this is a thoroughfare as turnpiked, literally or figuratively, specifically a viaduct, a staircase, causeway, course, highway, path, terrace. Um, and um, so what would that symbolize this course? If it's a thoroughfare or a path, a highway, would this be the path that we're on? Well, that the light of midnight cry lights. They fought from heaven. Yeah. The word lakam, is that correct? Yeah, the to to consume, yeah, lakam. To feed on. Yeah. Or to battle, to devour. Yeah. To fight, to overcome, to prevail. Yeah, and then it's going to be the stars from heaven in their courses that fight against Sisera. So right. this is from heaven, and these are the stars in their courses. Would this not be representative of those that have full reliance upon God to fight their battles. Yeah. And they're following the path that that's being lit by the midnight cry. Yes, agreed. I think that since God has ordained that each star or each planet would have a course, then he could be referring to us each having a role to play in this end time time movement, and we need to be faithful to that. And mm. sometimes there are many aspects to that role, but we need to be certain we're in the right place. Because mm -hmm. God guides the stars in their courses, for one. Okay. You can move on if you want. Well... So we would apply then Judges 5.20 as being an application of the midnight cry. Well, the light of the midnight cry, yeah, following. I mean, that's what we're, I mean, that's what's going to defeat Sisera or Parminder's message. Okay. So as we just read this next verse, the river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. What's so again, repetition. Right. So what kind of a structure do we see here? Um, well, again, it's, it's a chiasm. Um, Now, the word here for river is nachal, a stream, especially a winter torrent, a narrow valley, a brook, a shaft. Um, and then kaishan is the, means winding, right? So this has to do with the message of Parminder that's going to sweep them away. But, okay. And, and then it's going to say, so basically, uh, the river of kaishan sweeps away. The river of Kaishan, um, the river. So it's going to report, re repeat the river again of Kaishan. So you're actually going to have, uh, let me see, the river of Kaishan. Oh, 
So it's going to be mentioned twice, and then you have the river in between. So it's a mirror again. Well, what I, what I was looking at, the river of Kaishan swept them away. That ancient river. Right. Or ancient. ancient being Kadum. Yeah. So we're talking Kadum Nakal. Or Nakal Kadum. But this ancient river, is it not pristine? Well, that's what the word um, uh, Kadu means, a pristine hero. Okay. And that, right. And that comes from this word uh, to project oneself, that is, proceed, hence to anticipate, ace, and meet. Um, and so, now what does pristine mean? What about purity? Well, it can. I mean, unspoiled. Okay, right? so it, it, in its original condition. If we are if we are presenting an unspoiled gospel with the first, second, third angels' messages joined with the other angel of Revelation eighteen. Mm -hmm. Is that not a working definition of Kadum? Because the gospel itself, we can point to directly in Eden. Yeah. But I, I think, though, that the Hebrew word here doesn't really mean what the English word pristine means in every sense. Okay. Right. Because the idea of pristine originally uh, doesn't mean what it means now, because we think of it as unspoiled. Okay. But it actually has to do more with the word ancient. That's what it means, uh, pertaining to the earliest period. So this would refer to an ancient river or the earliest period of a river. So it's come to mean unspoiled over time, but that's not what it would have meant at the time the King James uh, translators translated this. Um, now, they're not using the word pristine, they're using the word ancient. But I'm just saying, uh, and when you look at these uh, um, lexicons or dictionaries, they're looking at the old meaning of the word pristine. Which I thought it had something to do with priests. Pristine has something to do with the priests. No, 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 no. It's nothing to do with oh, priests. Okay. No. So I've been educated wrong way. Okay. But the meaning, the meaning of unspoiled or untouched or pure, it doesn't come until yeah. 1899. Yeah, I knew that meaning too, but I also had read somewhere, I guess, that referring no. to the priesthood. Okay. No, no, no relations to the priesthood. Sure. It just means uh, uh, before, earlier. Uh, pre means before, uh, before now, basically. All right. Then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. What is important about the horse hoofs? Well, this would deal with Islam and the trampling underfoot, um, because here this is tramplings, of course, not prancings, but. Um, well, okay. But the Hebrew word, akab, mm -hmm. does that also not mean the heel? Um, okay, well, the heel, rear, footprint, hinder part, hoof, rear of a troop, footstep. Um, so look, it has two Hebrew words for horse hooves. Yeah, there's two Hebrew words. So the other one is sus. Uh, <clears throat> which just means horse, horse, right? So you got a horse's heel or a horse hoof. 
right? We just have one English word, but it's two Hebrew words. Well, that must have to do with Dan, who bit the horses' hooves, the, the heels of the horses. Could it? Well, it could, but because that, that could have some implication to a liar in wait. But the, the other question that I have to ask goes back to Eden. The heel, I don't know if I would put it here. Here, I, I wouldn't see how we would apply the serpent biting the heel in this context. Okay. Because here, these are horse hooves, right? So horses have, um, you know, they're going to be trampling down with, that's what these prancings are. Uh, it says with, with a galloper prancing. Um, well, I'm, I'm asking, since we're talking about the heel of the horse, would this have any interrelation to Genesis 3.15? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't think it would. Okay. Okay. I mean, the word exists. It's the same word for heal, but um, it's just the context is so different. Because you know that's going to be Christ's heel, and this this definitely is not Christ's heel. These horses, okay, that trample down the mighty ones. He is a man on a white horse, though. So. <laughs> okay. It's a pretty obscure sentence, though. It's hard to know what it means. But we have the prancings being mentioned, whether we're looking at this as prancings or tramplings. Yeah. Both twice. being mentioned here. Yeah, twice. And then the mighty ones, uh, the mighty one, it refers to an angel, a bull, the chiefest, the mighty one, right? So... Okay. So anyway, the point is they're overcome. Those that Sisera is overcome. That's the main point there. Right. Now we come to this. 523. Curse ye Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Who is Miraz representative of? Well, it's representative of, in the spirit of prophecy, of those that don't come to the aid of God's people All right. in presenting a message. Um, so I know Angela did some study on Maraz. No, I didn't. I just scanned, scanned through it, skimmed through it, and wrote That's down what funny. I should be looking at. I noticed in the Southern works, she does have a a title, something about Nashville being the center. Right. And I thought that's the one to look at first, but I still haven't done it. I've got the slew of things to do here that are occupying me. Yeah. So she says there is a class that are represented by Moroz. The missionary spirit has never take, taken hold of their souls. The calls of foreign missions have not stirred them to action. 
What account will those render to God who are doing nothing in his cause, nothing to win souls to Christ? Such will receive the denunciation, thou wicked and slothful servant. As an illustration of the failure on your part to come up to the work of God, as was your privilege, I was referred to these words, Curse ye, Maraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So, so she uses this as an example of those who are not uh, going to support the work of saving souls. What does this give reference to today within the movement? All of us are missionaries, whether we are dealing with foreign lands or we're dealing with those around us. Right now, Amen. right now, within our communities, in America and Canada, we have some of the greatest missionary efforts to be placed because many, especially these within the corporate church, are unwilling to study for themselves. They are more willing to let those that write a quarterly or their pastor tell them what to believe from scripture. Within the movement, we have others that are willing to follow after specific leaders. As you were saying earlier, much is being presented on basic Adventism, things that should have been understood years ago. Mm -hmm. As I said, the milk of the word, not the meat of the word. We have a lot to do so that we will not fall under the curse of mirage. So when it says, curse ye Miraz, says the angel of the Lord, curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof. Is it not Christ himself that is placing this curse? It sure sounds like it. And then when you guys were speaking, the verse that came to me was, uh, uh, take the book of the seek you the book of the Lord and read like we're supposed to be reading for us studying for ourselves uh, none of these shall fail none shall want her mate again it's like matching scripture you know testing scripture by scripture I think it's in Isaiah I'm trying to find it seek ye the Lord seek ye the book of the Lord and read. I think something like that In this chiasm, in this portion of this refrain, we have the kings of the earth and we have Miraz. They are being grouped together. Symbolically, what import can we derive from this? Are we to be following the false prophet? No. Are we, to, are, are we to be following Fox News? No. Are we to be following the beast through CNN? Mm -hmm. Are we to be following the dragon through the eternal world network? Mm -hmm. 
in all of these situations, we are to have our reliance upon the word of God, not upon the word of man. Yet, how many are truly delving deeply into the word to look to understand what it is saying for this time? It's not always easy to look at this in a symbolic and literal application. But we're needing to do it. Otherwise, we wind up very much like Ronald Reagan, mistaking the Antichrist and setting someone else in the place of Antichrist. Is that not what we're seeing going on within the church today? Uh -huh. Okay, why Isaiah 34, 16, and 17? Oh, Isaiah 34, 16 is the one that was coming to me. It says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read, No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Okay. Now, is there anything else that we can we can delve from this? Is there anything else we can take away from this section of this stanza of this song? Hmm. Up to verse 23, you're saying. Right, up to verse 23. So when we're looking at this, if we're considering from verses 19 to 23. Is there anything else that we can take away from this? If we, if we were to look at this in the way that the translators did in this particular verse on 523, where we come to the, the line where it says, because they came not to help. The references then that were being used took us back to Judges 21, verse 9. Now, we've covered this already. We have not looked at it deeply in the symbolism that's there, but we looked at what we could at that point. Judges 21, verse 9. For the people were numbered, and behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. 21.10. And the congregation sent thither 12,000 men of the valiantest and commanded them, saying, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword with the women and the children. And then we have Nehemiah 3.5. And next unto them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their neck into the work of the Lord. Jabesh Gilead's men were destroyed because they did not come to assist their brothers when they were called. They were like mirage because they came not to help now the other verses that are referenced here first samuel 17 47 
And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. 1 Samuel 18, 17. And Saul said to David, Behold my elder daughter Merab. Her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. 1 Samuel 25, 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Are we to fight our own battles? Or are we to fight the battles that the Lord commands? Are we to do this from our own strength or in God's strength? If we're looking for the blessing, we need to fight the Lord's battles. We need to be reliant upon his strength and upon his wisdom and not upon ours. Otherwise, we wind up no different than Miraz. Do we want a curse to be placed upon us? We need to lift the curse that's on us. You know, I've talked, talked to some people a bit about it. I thought this is just... I'm not getting anywhere here, so I may as well just re go back to praying about it and just doing what I need to do. I, I can't solve this mess. It's like trying to untangle untangle a huge ball of yarn. You know, the cat's been playing in. Okay. What else can we see? What other direction can we take from these warnings that are being given? So here, we know that a curse has been laid upon the kings that came to fight and upon Marats. The next stanza begins, Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. We've just come through a passage where a curse is being pronounced. Now we're coming into a passage where a blessing is being pronounced. Why is JL being blessed? Okay, well, so we know JL, of course, is the one that puts the uh, spike through the temples of Sisera. And uh, we already have this tent um, referring to uh, specifically to the chronology related to me, right, being 168 is the number for the word tent. Now, a woman here um, is a, a symbol usually for a church. Okay. So would it be referencing the group of or the message connected to um, 
the chronology that uh, specifically of July 18, 2020. Okay, now why are, why are there so many different translations and meanings of the name JL? Um, well, what, what are the different translations you have? I'm looking at some that would say that this means prominence. Some would say that this means mountain goat. Yeah, an ibex, a climbing, which would relate to the word prominence more figuratively. And so, some would say to be profit or to be useful. Hmm, I'm not sure why they have that. Now, curiously, <laughs> it, I, I note that this can describe both the male and the female mountain goat. Okay. So women, yes. Representative of a church. JL, the wife of Heber. What did we determine Heber to me? Well, Heber means a community. Okay. So do we have a community of old goats? Or a comrade. <laughs> um, what what do we have here? I mean, do we have another example in scripture? of someone that is to be blessed above women. Well, that's Mary. Right. So is JL being compared with Mary? Well, in the sense symbolically, we have this message that should, um, give birth to the character of Christ, the Christ okay. shall be born in you. Um, so this obviously is not referring to a person again, uh, but referring to uh, a part of the movement. Then symbolically, what can we take from blessed shall she be above women in the tent? Well, here, tent, um, I mean, we've had the tent of Heber mentioned a few times, right? I mean, one is there's going to be the tent in which uh, Sisera enters. Um, but the idea that we had here, and this was going back to chapter four, um, when it introduces Heber, uh, where is this? Uh, 411, now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, right? Zanaim, the gematria for that was 65, and tent, the Hebrew word is 168. And if we multiply that by 77, we get my home address, 12936, 65 Street. Um, so, so there's a symbol there dealing with this message, specifically the message of July 18th. And we have this tent being mentioned. So they talk about him pitching his tent. Um, and I mean, we never really look so much at um, uh, the word pitch, but it means to stretch or spread out. Um, you know, to lay out, lay down. Um, so it has lots of different meanings, but this has to do, I think, partly with these lines again. And then she's going to be in the tent that that Cicero is going to enter. 
she covers him with a mantle and then she finds out who he is after she gives him milk to drink when he asks for water and then of course she's going to kill him you know that just came to me okay <clears throat> When Jeff appointed a very unfaithful underling to succeed him, we didn't discern right away what was going on. He certainly didn't, like Jeff was just betrayed. He trusted Parm Parminder and so many other people. And then we discovered who Parminder was and Tess and people like them. Mm -hmm. And we had to destroy, in a sense, them. Like we had to separate ourselves from them. Well, it was easy to do that since they didn't want to have a thing to, with us anyway. But that's when we have the message of July 18th presented by the movement. So JL must represent the movement given yeah. the message of July 18th. But it's, it's more than that. It's, a, it's just that standing up for truth in, in, in general, standing up for the standard. For God's standard, not the world's standard, because they've gone to the world completely. They've gone to social, like deep left, far left socialism. Okay. So blessed above women shall JL, shall the mountain goat, the wife of Heber, the Kenite be, blessed shall she be above women in the tent. So the blessing is being given to a movement that takes action. Would that be a fair assumption? Okay, so so JL represents the movement um, proclaiming July 18th. The portion that is proclaiming July 18th, yes. That's going to give the warning to Nashville. Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we have moments remaining in our time together today. I think this, this entire stanza is worthy of some very deep consideration. My assignment for all of you for tomorrow, go through this portion. So we're, we're going to start with verse 24. 24 to 27 is going to deal with JL. And then from 28 to the end of the book is going to deal with the, the balance that we have to deal with of all of the rest of what we're seeing in Judges 5. Read this carefully for tomorrow. Direct your time in this to see what can be addressed. Come back with some notes as to items figuratively that you see. And let's begin to address this all tomorrow. Any other comments or any other thoughts? Yeah, Isaiah 54, two, enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. And the whole thing is restoration. It's just beautiful, the promises in Isaiah 54. It's encouraging us just to keep on going, keep on fighting these battles, and God will mightily bless us. Okay. Any other comments, any other thoughts? Any other questions today? Okay, 
Shall we close with prayer? Loving Father, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for these items on which we need to ponder today. Direct our minds, direct our paths, show us that that you would have us to do. Help us now, guide us, so that that which is done may bring glory to you, to your name, and to your character on this day. Be with us now. Bring us again together safely tomorrow. If this is your will, for this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.